Huh? We were right? What? We're never right. The giant robot has finally awakened. A being created by Joy Boys Hockey has arrived to save his successor, who is currently becoming a cartoon character, breaking the rules of reality. Let's talk about it. Oh, by the way, sorry for the late video, but I was on a bit of a vacation. Also, thanks for helping us reach 280 subs. If you haven't become a citizen of Nerdvale yet, how about giving it a whirl and subscribing to enjoy more One Piece reviews and theories? Do it. An explosion occurs on the Labostratum barrier. We see Mars who made it through the Labostratum shield. We talked about how Vegapunk's technology are impressive in the last chapter, given how durable the barrier is. But it seems that the elders are even more powerful. He passes through the barrier unharmed, maybe by making the hole in the barrier or injuring himself passing through and then regenerating. Jinbei immediately notices Mars, sensing his immeasurable power, and mentions that the haki emanating from him is unreal. Due to this, Jimbe springs into action to grab Zoro and get out of there. However, Zoro tells him to stop and that Rob Lucci is still standing. Sanji reminds Jimbe that they have no time to waste. As he grabs Zoro, Lucci approaches them. Since the helmsman has no time to waste, he apologizes to Lucci and delivers a 5000 break fist. Impressively, Lucci takes on this attack and only loses his leopard form. As he drops to one knee, still conscious. Honestly, Lucci is more impressive than we thought. Most of Zoro's opponents just go down after his final move. And on top of that, he isn't even out after Jimbe piled on with another incredible attack. This proves how durable Luchi has become, as having Zoro defeating him in one attack just didn't make sense. As we said in the previous chapter, they were being portrayed as even. We also discussed the possibility of Jimbe needing to intervene since they needed to speed things along for their escape to be successful. Mars arrives on the scene, addressing Luchi, demanding where York is. The next panel focuses on Jimbe and Zoro running away, wondering what that thing is. We go back to Luchi answering Mars's question, explaining that York is in the control room on the fourth floor of building A, and that the two that just ran off are Zoro and Jinbei. He gives all the info that he has acquired from his time spent on the Labo Stratum. He finishes by saying that there's six minutes left before Vegapunk's message. Luchi just keeps on impressing us, not just with his strength, but with his talent of gathering information. Could he be as impressive as Guernica, who was able to defeat Izo and X Drake, and after even managed to postpone the Luffy Kai? Fight. The Elder tells Luchi that he did splendid work and he has no further queries. As the Elder leaves, Luchi yells out one last thing, saying that his partner is in the control room and is badly injured, and pleads to find a way to spare him. The Elder answers that it might not be possible, since it's hard to single out one lone insect when getting rid of the hive, as he rushes towards the control room. This moment is interesting, since Cypherpool agents are supposed to be ruthless, but the bond that he shares with Kaku is clearly strong. The next part of the chapter goes back to Luffy with Dory and Broggy. They say to Luffy, it has been two years, and they can hardly recognize him. They add that there are tales of a god that resembles Luffy in their homeland, and are surprised that Luffy knows what he looks like, saying that his appearance is a pleasant surprise. Much like when Bonnie asked him, Luffy laughs at this, saying he doesn't know what they're talking about, but they'll talk more later. Topman and Saturn notice the giants and realize that this is much more complicated than they first thought. The two giants then turn around as they see the two remaining elders. They say they look like beasts from the jungle in their homeland. If you forgot, Nushijuro is currently galloping around the island, neutralizing all the remaining pacifistas, while Jupiter has been cut to ribbons by Dory and Bragi, and as we know, Mars is currently trying to disable the broadcast. Luffy yells out to them that this is not the time to fight, which is surprising coming from Luffy, right? And that they should run away. Dory and Bragi told Luffy that they know, as they saw Sanji earlier, who told them the same thing. We see an awesome map of Egghead, with all of the different groups, and how far from the goal to escape they actually are. This is is a bit weird because the group names are Nami and Usopp's group, the Luffy group, Sanji and Vegapunk's group, as well as Bonnie's group. Here every group is named after a straw hat, except for Bonnie's. 
But Frankie is with her, so shouldn't it be Frankie's group? Maybe we are reading into it, but this could be an indication that Bonnie is actually going to join the Straw Hat crew, as we have said many times before. Dory blows a horn that can be heard across Egghead Island, signaling to the giant's crew to retreat. Warcury realizes that the horn is a signal, saying that this won't do, and delivers an insanely powerful roar in Luffy and the giant's direction. As the trio hold on to their lives after this powerful attack, we see a panel of Luffy losing his shoes and even his eyes popping out from his body. This attack was so powerful that it even reached the coast of Egghead Island. Dorian Bragi asks if Straw Hat is okay, and said that his body looked a bit funky. Luffy checks if he's okay, and says that was close. The Giants add that this was a Conqueror's Hockey roar, and they wonder who this guy is. As Luffy tells them, he's just some government big shot, we see how much Luffy is still susceptible to hockey in this scene. Not only this, but how powerful the Gorose are. We saw everyone reacting to Saturn's hockey when he showed up, and the Black Lightning seemed to be hockey as everyone thought, but getting confirmation from Oda that they all have Conqueror's Hockey skyrockets them to the top of everyone's tier list. Not only are their yokai or demon devil fruits incredibly powerful, but they can use Conquerors as well, including advanced Conquerors since imbuing Conquerors into attacks is what this is, like Warcury just demonstrated. Warcury is not finished. He jumps into the air and charges towards them, as we see his tusks have been turned into blades. Dorian Bragi counter with the Sun Shield Sfallen. This is a reference to the legendary shield in Nordic mythology that stands in front of the sun, protecting the world from its heat. Oda likes to flip stuff around in mythology though. So here, he did the reverse, where they're actually protecting the sun from others, while still standing in front of the sun. As Saint Toppin tries to get past this move, he asks the giants what quirk of destiny ties them together, and if they know who this man is. They answer that of course they do, and that he's their buddy. In chapter 1106, we saw that Dory said or should we call him Sun God. So we had assumed that Dory and Bragi had learned that Luffy was the Sun God because of what they said. But it feels like after asking Luffy about it, since he didn't know what that meant, they decided to just let it go. Probably assuming it's just a coincidence since they say, where did you learn about how he looks? But this is interesting since Kuma told Bonnie that no one knew what he looked like. The Giants knowing would make sense. As we made it clear in our chapter 1106 review, the entire culture worships the sun. It's also very plausible that the previous incarnation of Nika was also a giant. Dory and Bragi counterattack with a split Skyland, tossing him backwards. The giant pirate captain keep on being super impressive. This is unsurprising, as they are the captains of one of the strongest crews in history. But it is interesting that they immediately understood that Warcury's attack was Conqueror's Hockey. Could this be a sign that the two are wielders of this mighty power? That would make sense based on their strength and status. On the other hand, they have been alive for hundreds of years, so maybe it's just experience talking. Saturn says that if they're on his side, then they must be erased from the world history along with him. Saturn starts shooting poison bullets, while Luffy tells the giants to watch out. This moment was so funny. Turtles and I just couldn't stop laughing. It was too much. He rips out a palm tree and starts biting at the wood, transforming it into a baseball bat that he even paints black. He puts on a baseball cap, prepares a swing, striking all the bullets and sending it back to the two elder members. This is just absolutely crazy. <laughs> I'm wondering if you thought something was weird. Where did he get the paint? The tree makes sense, but the baseball helmet and the paint? What the f***? What's even more hilarious is that Luffy is actually using hockey here. The hockey is the paint, except instead of Oda coloring it, Luffy does it himself. Is this the start of Luffy breaking the fourth wall? Or the fourth page? As Kaido said during their fight, Luffy reminded him of a character from a comic strip. Perhaps the more Luffy learns to master his abilities, the more it will affect the actual panels in the story. Kicking a character out of the page, for instance. Or Luffy referring to us directly instead of just winking at the audience. It would be easy to believe that Nika is actually a fictional character and not a mythological one. What do you mean by that? We know that hockey seems to be alive in all living things. Perhaps before the time of Joy Boy and the events leading to the One Piece world regressing in technology, Nika was a fictional comic strip character who brought laughter and joy to everyone who read these comics. And something cataclysmic happened where the hockey and desires of everyone collectively came together to bring life to this fictional character in the form of a devil fruit who became the savior of humanity or the insects as the Gorosei like to say. As the poison bullets reach the Gorosei, they explode, creating 
several mushroom clouds that shocks Luffy. One of the other giants mentions to their captains that the flames will block the forest and that they should go. The two captains laugh, saying that they're done for anyway. Luffy informs them that this isn't the case, since it seems that these elders are immortal. Dory and Brogy are shocked by this revelation and start running away, saying that if they are truly immortal, that is the first time they've heard of something like this existing, and that this isn't a trait or an ability of any race that they have heard of. We're not going to get into this as we have an entire video dedicated to that. If you're interested to know why we think that the Gorsei represent demons, go watch that video. We go back to where the Sunny is. As Nami tells Jinbe and Zoro to hurry up, Bonnie's group arrives at the giant's ship where they notice people waiting for them. It's some of the Marine Vice Admirals. They announce that they will deal with Bonnie. The Straw Hats are not the main target Bonnie is. She will always be a target for the world government now, since she could, in theory, take control of all the pacifistas. We talked about this before, but the chances of Bonnie joining the crew keep increasing every chapter. It would make sense for Luffy to take her under his wing as his cabin girl, to protect her from the world government. In chapter 1107, we even saw Luffy mentoring her a bit, since she wanted to know how to punch like Nika. This would also be paying back Kuma for all of the times that he helped them throughout the story. We briefly go back to the command center, where the giant bird asks York where the control room is, so he can stop Vegapunk's broadcast. York is terrified by the talking beast and asks who they are and cries in fear, obviously. The next two panels show Kizaru saying that he's severely injured and just to let him rest. Kizaru has taken so much punishment with zero rest since he has entered this conflict. And unfortunately, he cannot heal from eating like Luffy can. So he's definitely done even though he has been so impressive in this arc, even drawing against Luffy. This chapter ends on what Famfi and I have been waiting for. The giant robot of dream appears. The marines seeing it mention that it's way bigger than the giants and that the flames don't seem to affect it as it's growling something. The final panel reveals that this growl is the robot apologizing to Joy Boy. Yep, 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 yep. So we basically have been talking about this for over 19 chapters, but the gist of it is the same as we discussed previously with Nika. The same way Nika might have been created by the desires and hockey of people, Joy Boy may have done something similar to this giant. We have talked about this a lot, so if you're interested to learn more about this, be sure to check the links at the end of the video. As we said in our previous videos, this idea comes from Zunisha and how he was reacting to Luffy's hockey when he turned into Gear 5 for the first time. This scene of the giant apologizing is also very reminiscent of Zunisha, since if you don't remember, it seemed like Zunisha had also wronged Joy Boy in some way, as he she was ordered to roam the seas for an eternity. Speaking of which, don't you find Zunisha's proportions very strange? Like they're stretched out in a way? Perhaps Zunisha is more similar to the giant than we think, and might have been another creation of Joy Boy. Since we know that the Hito Hito no Mi model Nika seems to affect reality, the fact that Luffy could affect reality is unreal, but we see glimpses of it with how he affects the nearby environment, just like with the baseball bat, but also how characters' bodies are affected by his fruit, such as him punching through people with his Gomu Gomu no star gun in a cartoonish manner. It seems that his hockey is also a power source, or at least sensing it seems to trigger some to awaken from their slumber. Like it seems to be the case with Zunisha and the giant. Another possibility for the giant and Zunisha could be that Joy Boy, as a punishment, has trapped them in this artificial form. Since we know that previously, Luffy can create things seemingly out of thin air. So the question is, could the giant robot be an inanimate object powered by Joy Boy's hockey? Or is it an individual trapped in that form that could only awaken when Joy Boy returns? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching our chapter 1111 review. Hope you enjoyed. Do you like the idea that Nika used to be a comic book character who was brought to life in the One Piece world? Again, let us know in the comments. If you want to learn more about Joy Boy and his Nakamas, as well as how Gear 5 works, we discussed this topic in our chapter 1106 review. Check it out. Peace out.